This is a production of Cornell University. Yeah, w- uh, welcome everybody. This is the 13th episode of our spring series, the Cornell Turf Show. Fastest 30 minutes in turf. We've been keeping it condensed and, and getting you guys all the information in a timely, fan- in a timely manner here uh, for the springtime. Our guest today is going to be Dr. Leah Brillman of DLF Pixseed, a uh, real seed guru. But we're excited to talk about bentgrass seed in the springtime, uh, a topic of conversation whenever we get around uh, with superintendents in our Northeast region here. Uh, but as always, we'll, we'll get started today with uh, Frank Rossi, a little overview of our last week. You know, Frank, it seems like every time we, we do one of these webinars on Thursday and Friday, we've got snow out for whatever reason. Uh, so we've really had these uh, stops and starts to the fall. Yeah. Um, I'm sure you'll talk about that in a little bit. But uh, as always, you've got a, a cool little image here. Bring it, bring yeah, it up, yeah. pals to work, it looks like. Yeah, that's right. And, and you know, uh, whether it's... Uh, Bringing your pal to work uh, in the shop or bringing your kid to golf. Uh, I, we ha- I have a former employee and colleague who uh, took a picture of this on the golf course and said, Carl, this is going to be you pretty soon uh, with the stroller out there and the kid practicing uh, your putting. So, so uh, always a good way to start. The equipment is starting to show up uh, on golf courses where everybody's uh, bragging on their big stuff and, and a big old mower. Uh, like that always makes a, a, a golf guy uh, all happy. And of course, uh, Leah in the Northeast girl, we're starting to rip it up. Uh, this is a pretty standard scene around a lot of the uh, golf courses, which is, I have to say, a bit funny to me sometimes because I feel like sometimes, uh, like on the bottom left here, you see a picture that Steve Cook uh, tweeted uh, from Medina. And I've been on those greens and I can tell you, sometimes they look absolutely perfect and you wonder, what the hell are they doing this for? They're absolutely perfect, and they're making a mess of them. So listen, Carl, before we get into our little weather update and a little chat with Leah, why don't you start a little bit with the tip of the day and remind everybody, this is brought to you by our project uh, with the Rochester Institute of Technology, the environmental results program that's focused on improving uh, BMP adoption uh, in New York State, particularly west uh, of I-81. Um, there's a website you can go to to learn more, and, and Carl's got a poster uh, that he uh, received in the mail that everybody who's part of this west of I-81 should have gotten in the golf business. If you didn't, reach out to Carl, and if you'd like one, you can go to that website and grab one. And so, Carl, the topic for today is spot treating, but, you know, because we were struggling uh, a bit to know what kind of conversation what we'd have, we probably would throw in uh, selecting good varieties as well. But let's talk about spot treating today. Yeah, so, you know, one, one of the aims of this poster is, to, of course, create awareness of best management practices to reduce our resource use. And, and spot treating is probably the best way you're going to get to reducing uh, pesticide use. This also could be applied to fertilizer. You see in our poster, it's on the pest section, but um, really applying pesticides only, only to the places you need them. So uh, we actually saw a recent article in the USJ Green section uh, this is from uh, Superintendent Andrew Jorgensen uh, down there in Ocala, Florida, and they have a, a problem. I think it's pine pine needle grubs or a certain insect pest. Uh, and what he's got is a real simple solution. Instead of applying that insecticide to the entire property, when he's out there scouting, he's got his little utility cart and a and a spreader, just a small spreader on the back of the of that cart. Whenever he sees uh, grubs, whenever he scouts in a certain area, he can just apply only the amount that's necessary instead of going across, you know, 20, 30 acres of, of fairway or rough area. Uh, and, and another reason to spot treat it, you know, we, we see this uh, out in Wisconsin, Madison, Paul Koch is partnered with the folks at the University Ridge Golf Course there uh, and putting weather stations on two different fairways and seeing that consistently one fairway is, is 15% lower in the Smith Kearns dollar spot pr- pressure than another area. And what does that say? You know, that, that could be the difference between treating that ninth fairway, uh, you know, two or three times less over the course of the year than a, that 18th fairway. So again, reducing our acreage that we're treating, lowering those uh, the overall pesticide use. And of course that lowers your budget and the labor time to spray these areas too. So being a little bit more strategic in these spot treatment methods when we're thinking about pesticides. We've talked about this with fertilizer and, and the growth rate uh, earlier in our, our spring series, but uh, just a, a really excellent way to reduce your pesticide use and be really targeted. And no doubt, Carl, because, you know, we really have the technology there both to collect the data and to make the application, right? So let's start out with uh, some of the weather 
data that drives some of the decisions that we're making. And this tends to be a popular conversation um, among golf course superintendents at this time for root pathogens, as we've talked about. We had John, Johnny Inguijado with us uh, a couple of weeks ago talking about root pathogens and timing it for soil temperatures and, and making effective applications. And you can see when you get down into the metropolitan New York area, we're getting pretty warm soils now. I think they're pretty good uh, estimation that we're going to stall a little bit for the weekend, uh, but soon uh, start to see warming up. And, and our, our weather guru, Art D. Gaetano, on the conference call this morning uh, said clearly that we can put a fork in the winter and we're going to hold them to that uh, after this coming weekend. We should be done with it uh, and turning the corner and warming up, uh, moving on forward. Now, the interesting thing about the season so far is uh, just this last week, we got a nice patch of rainfall and it mostly fell where it was needed the most. If you look at the drought map on the right, you can see the, uh, the southeastern New England and Massachusetts uh, up into Vermont. Uh, now, New Hampshire and Maine, not so much. But certainly a little that, you know, up the, up the Connecticut River Valley and along the coast by the Cape, Long Island got some rain. Uh, this helped some of the drier areas uh, that are already happening throughout the Northeast. Now, the other thing you're going to notice uh, is, is what, something we talked about again this morning on our conference call is how the growing season now stalls and how this sort of give, informs us about the things we target. You know, uh, one thing, for example, is uh, crabgrass emergence and forsythia bloom. You know, Rich Buckley was talking this morning with us saying, you know, I got half green, half gold out, you know, near my house. Uh, and I think I'm starting to see uh, the growing degree day model is indicating that the annual bluegrass weevil adults should be moving and wondering if people are looking. You know, we're quite a bit ahead last week. And now it looks like we're getting close to normal. And, you know, you can accumulate quite a bit of degree days uh, in one day uh, in the spring. So you want to be careful, get out there, keep looking. It's good to have the data, but it's also good to go take a look. Well, speaking of having to take a look, there was one particular thing that Rich mentioned this morning that seemed to be coming into the lab a little bit more than normal. And I think you could say it has something to do with the slow growth rate, and that is brown ring patch or whiteia right, the Waitia patch that's come on and become, you know, a lot of people think a cosmetic problem for the most part, but when you look at the ridges of this particular pathogen, you can see in many cases, let me just draw a little, let me get my pen here, and you can see right along, you know, for those of you watching live or watching the recording, for those of you on the podcast, I can't help you with this sometimes, but we think we still want you to hear this. When you look along the edge of the ring, sometimes you'll see pitting. You can almost see it in this one picture here where it starts to really decline, gets a little pitted and can affect ball roll a little bit. So obviously top dressing can help with this because the grass will recover from it. And some of the issue uh, is related to the slowing of growth. You know, whether you're slowing of growth because you're drier or you're slowing of growth because you're cooler, the Waitia patch on putting green seems to be increasing. Now, the way to approach this from my perspective is first to, you know, decide, well, with warm weather coming and, you know, maybe my growth regulators are wearing off and obviously your growth regulator program could be impacting this because slower growing uh, plants are going to have a bigger problem with this. You can go to the UW website, which has this really nice, uh, it basically takes the, uh, you know, the uh, turf grass diseases thing that's come from uh, Paul Vincelli at Kentucky and now Bruce Clark and Paul uh, are involved uh, involved in this and and it's online so you can type in brown ring patch and get this particular uh, web go to this particular website type in brown ring patch and you get a collection of products that that provide control now I looked at this in in the publication itself and what I noticed from looking through here you know three is you know, there's efficacy, right? It means it's pretty good. It's been shown in research. Uh, but the A uh, uh, superscript indicates a lot of these are two double E values. So, you know, they work and they're special labels for your state. You can write a, a two double E exemption for some products if they show efficacy, but it's not necessarily on the label. And of course, this applies uh, federally as well as, as in particularly here in New York State. But one of the one of the products I want to draw your attention to is a firm or 
polyoxin. We've had a very effective control with this. And I think Andy Wilson would say that uh, from some of our work at Beth Page. Uh, we've had really good effective control with that product. But the other thing I want to draw your attention to is when you get into these combination products, right, you may have a, a product that has some efficacy, you know, efficacy by itself, but then, you know, is it in the combination at the same rate? Make sure you're looking at some of these things if you choose, if you choose to make an application for this particular package. Okay, so the topic for today, and I'm going to set you up, uh, I'm going to set you up, Lee, as good as I can do it, right? We're going to talk about bent grass, and I'm going to bring up traffic tolerance. I'm going to bring up, you know, the pressure that golf is under. This is rounds of golf after the pandemic. You can see year over year, month to month, month to month, we were seeing big, big surges uh, in uh, play uh, throughout the country. And I think you know this as well as I do, that play is relentless, right? You start to see where play gets focused on putting greens right around the cup. And then this is, and I flew through that, but now I'll go a little slower, right? This is the growth rate, uh, you know, proposed by uh, Turgeon and Vargas a number of years ago, uh, you know, in their POA annua book. And at the same time, they suggest a growth uh, cycle like this for creeping bent grass. And, it, you know, it suggests that it, you know, comes on, you know, these are a little bit disjointed here, but essentially this is suggesting that grow, active growth, top growth anyway, doesn't really ensue on the bent grasses until much later in the spring, certainly compared to POA annua. Now, Leah, uh, Carl's been playing around with this in our research program with Dave Hicks, our golf course superintendent here at Cornell. And we took a, a shaded green that was a lot of annual bluegrass and compared it to a wide open green that had a lot more creeping bent grass. Uh, and we were collecting clippings throughout the year. And rather than trust that, you know, prescribed growth cycle, you know, Carl uh, and Dave and the staff were collecting clippings. And the blue line here is the Poe annual green. And the red line here uh, is the creeping bent grass green. And so you can see there clearly are times uh, when you get a little more growth uh, than others, but it also doesn't seem to follow the exact uh, pattern that they showed uh, in those graphics, Leah. So, so when we measure these things, we do see some advantage to annual bluegrass at certain times, and we also see some advantage to uh, creeping bent grass at certain what times cultivar? relative to growth rate. What cultivar? Well, is okay, yeah, yeah. Th these are really old bent pole greens. You set me up perfectly, Leah, because <laughs> now it becomes a broader discussion, right? And I'm just showing this picture to show and say. There are very big differences uh, between these cultivars. And I didn't pick any of these pictures with any particular intent involved, just to say, as you just said, cultivars make a difference. And I want to draw attention to this, not just for putting greens, Leah, but Carl has been thinking about this a lot for fairway selection about uh, bent grass resist, you know, dollar spot resistant varieties and the value that they can bring uh, to an operation. And so if you look at the Smith Kearns model, Carl took the data and put it out over nine growing seasons and you set their threshold of 20% where you start to have to worry or may, might probably trigger your spraying for dollar spot. And then you say, well, if I got a resistant variety, maybe I don't see dollar spot until it's about 40% uh, on the Smith Kearns model. And I think James Hempfling uh, might've done, and you may be privy to some of this, they might have done some of this work at Rutgers with some of these varieties with they're the Smith Kearns. Do, they've model. done some, and they're they're doing more. Yeah. And um, using threshold models, you having a dollar spot resistant variety. In some years, you could reduce the number of sprays you needed by, well, say you only needed three sprays on a threshold or one spray on a threshold where you needed nine on a, re, on a susceptible variety. So it right. really does, and it, and it is most important on a fairway bent grass. That's where you're gonna really, you really need it. You, you should always ask that first before you select a bent grass for a fairway is how resistant is it to dollar spot? 
Yeah, and thank you for saying that because for those of you watching the video or live, you know, you see this graph of nine years and there are, in fact, if you have a 40% threshold, there are at least two years here where you wouldn't need to treat uh, at all. So what you're saying, you know, that that's exactly what we're talking about, Leah. And then, you know, some of, so, so there's some of the really positive things, right? But then there's these ideas, well, you got to fuss with them, you know, because they get leggy and maybe they pock up. This is some of our traffic work. Uh, that we've done with golf shoes where we've, you know, you twist and turn around the cup and you see the bent grass respond. And of course, you know, the early spring growth conditions, Leah, uh, is something that, you know, this is uh, Tommy, Tommy Witt's place in Chicago with a beautiful bent grass fairway there. And so here's the questions for today, kid. Let's start with traffic tolerance. You know, I showed those things early, those, those slides earlier that, um, that showed potential growth rate. We don't have to look at the pick questions. I'll bring them up as we go. Um, what do you say when people say, well, you know, I get a lot of spring golf. Um, I, I can't, you know, I don't know how to have a bent grass fairway or bent grass green because I get too much traffic. How do you answer that to start? Well, I don't know about other bent grass breeders, but me and then working, I've been working first when I was working, but also working a lot with Rutgers University, was we found we were losing the battle with bent grass more in the spring and the fall than we were in the summer. And, you know, originally they started talking about we needed more heat tolerance in um, bent grasses. Well, it was Sean Emerson who said, no, I don't need more heat tolerance. The heat tolerance is fine. What I need is more spring and fall growth because we need that to take the golfers and we need that to compete with the poannua. So I started, I switched a lot of the bent grass breeding and our emphasis became besides dollar spot because we threw anything away that got significant dollar spot was spring and fall growth because that was when we were losing the battle with, um, with poannua. So for instance, we've also been having talks with Chris Tritterbaugh of Hazeltine and um, he's got some trials there. And um, we've been debating how best to measure this, especially in, in cool temperature areas. You know, how do I go out and select for that particular thing? And so he and I have an idea and we've been comparing notes for a couple of years on when you first see dew on the bent grass is when we think it may be actively growing. So it may enable us to put bent grass up far north and find the ones that actually show that do first thing to select for um, that spring growth, that spring green up. So he noticed that one of our um, newer cultivars, McDonald, he had it showing, not only was it growing later in the fall for him in his, in his trials, it actually was coming on and it was showing do, do two weeks or more earlier in some of the other bent grasses he had in the trial. So it's, we've learned that's what we have to do. And that is one of our emphasis and has been for 20 years is to try and get those saddle um, conditions for um, creeping bent grass so we can compete with POA. So even if you do that, Leah, even if you do that and get early spring growth and you even get in periods where bent grass grows well, is it your opinion that there is a limit to traffic with bent grass where you're, it's too much traffic for bent grass? Not in the newest cultivars, okay? And part of it is um, we've also been um, working with um, Rutgers to put wear machines across those trials. And so you can't, Anytime you're a breeder of bent grass or any species, you have to be thinking of multiple things at the same time. So we put wear machines across those. So we look for those that the clones to put in our new cultivars that also responded well in both fairway trials and in greens trials to the wear machines. And we didn't lose cover with those wear machines when they put it on. So I really think the newer material will um, take the wear. It'll grow in the spring and fall. 
And, but that's not every new cultivar. It's ones that have been looked at intensively and only, you know, and you throw out 90% of the material um, in the long term. And even when you think you've got a success, sometimes something else shows up and it may not work. And so let me, let me feed on that because, you know, our pal Dan Dinelli, who we love and adore uh, at North Shore, has probably taught us both a little bit about bankgrass management and bankgrass cultivar selection. He talks a lot about segregation. And you and I are on that little text chain that we keep with Mike Fadonza and some of these other people. And this came up about, you know, when you're building a bankgrass variety, you're using different clones to put them together. And then you get that segregation. Can you talk about anything we know about how that level of segregation potentially impacts performance? Because it sounds to me like, well, you could have some that are some clones that are good for early spring and then some that are better for traffic tolerance long term. And maybe that's where the segregation comes from. And, and is that good or bad? And I guess I need you to ask me about answer me about segregation in general. Okay, segregation in general, we used to see it a lot more and most people think about what they would see with pin cross, the segregation uh, into the, essentially you could see those three cl clones that made the cross, the original cross to it. And you had the one that always purpled, you had the one that grew this way and um, that would do it. And as we develop bent grasses and it's through multiple, multiple cycles of selection, We've selected against that segregation. We've tried to make those, all those clones perform very similarly, look very similar in appearance. Um, and I will tell you, I would say every generation we've gotten better. So the current, I would say the ones that were in the last NTAP and the ones that are prop, I don't know all of them in the current ones, but the ones we've been dealing with, um, I know I walk every single one of those breeder blocks to make them 100% uniform. I also got out and walked in those foundation fields to make sure we didn't see anything that looked at all different. And because the clones we've been selecting for 20 years for ones that looked most similar to each other, and we're very carefully at each stage of the line, I won't say you won't see zero, but say 20 years ago, the ones I created, you maybe saw 0.1%. And 0.1% in creeping bent grass, if you've got 6 million seeds per pound, that can be a lot of potential plants. And even if most of them don't get established, you would still see occasional segregates. Mm -hmm. In the last 10 years, um, 007, Great variety, probably one of the most adaptable varieties we've ever released, um, grown everywhere. We still see an occasional plant that will show up for us, okay? That's a little different in growth habit. But this latest generation, I would say, we don't see them. We have yet to see any segregation in them. So how excited are you about the prospect of POA cure? Let's say everybody learns how to use it right. It eliminates a lot of the pressure that you guys have selected for a little bit. But I wonder if it doesn't potentially create other problems. I wonder if sometimes, you know, having the poet creep in teaches us, well, maybe you got to not have that. Where are you at with, and I'm sure you're in many ways thinking about this because the potential for you to sell a lot of bentgrass seed uh, with the idea that POA cure if used properly is a potentially sustainable way with other growth regulators and other things of not having annual bluegrass problems. How does that really shift or change any of your thinking, Leah, having POA cure on the market? Well, we, we actually, we have a bitgrass advisory group and we talked to a lot of them about POA cure. Some of them are currently using it and have used it for many years, especially in very high poa pressure areas along the coast of um, California, some of these areas. Um, we've got others who played with it and they decided, for instance, they like trim it just as well or better um, and they consistently use it. Um, one of the things I think is important that we have at least two things to depend upon. So poa cure and trim it. Now, I was running figures the other day because we were asking about um, 
we had gotten the thing from golf course industry that showed, you know, the power cure ad and we, we were looking at the cost and we were thinking about fairway applications. Okay. So we actually went through the whole numbers and what I came up with on their rate for fairway is each app was um, about $850 per acre. Okay. Each application of power cure. So I ran the numbers the other day, just because I was semi curious what it would come to. I don't know how many people are, and then they say one to six apps and you kind of roll your eyes, right? Um, so um, greens, I definitely think it will help. And I think we do have to remember, we do need to use rotations because if I also on the advisory with some of the POA um, and we know POA will adapt given an opportunity. We know this about That's right. POA annual. That's right. That's right. All right. So listen, Thank you for mentioning fairways. And that's where I want to wrap up because there's a running argument underway here at Cornell about the right fairway grass. And I couldn't let you get away. And I know we've been talking about bent grass and I, you know, and, and I know that maybe everything else is second rate in other people's minds, but I'd like to hear from you. If you don't have a lot of resources, if you might have irrigation, but you don't really want to have to rely on it. You know, if you have a, a lot of traffic uh, on your fairways, uh, or maybe not much traffic on your fairways, maybe you have heavy soils that even if you don't fertilize, the grass grows a lot. Um, I'm, I'm putting you on the spot there, Leah. Um, is bent grass always the right choice for fairways? And if it's not, what's your second choice? I don't know if bent grass is always the right choice. I mean, um, especially under certain environments. Um, Kentucky bluegrass, if you choose the right ones, and part of them is people were convinced they, they had to get these ones that are actually midnight types, which were again, non-competitive against Poanua. So you need ones that, Kentucky bluegrasses that again, early spring green up, late fall growth with good wear tolerance, um, decent drought tolerance, they can give you a pretty good solution. Most sites, especially a heavy soil, fine fescues may not be a good choice for a heavy soil in spite of what people will try and tell you. Um, <laughs> but then we also need to think about maybe fine fescue bluegrass blends. We've done some interesting ones with those. Um, even fine fescues with creeping bent grass. What about colonial? What about, what about fine fescue colonial? Are you still worried about brown patch with colonials? Well, yes. And the problem is we've had very high issues and so has the entire industry. We're having a hard time getting colonial bent grasses actually produced oh. because there are only a certain number, true colonials, not highland, because there are only a certain number of growers and we've lost a lot of those acres. So it's become an, a very significant um, thing on getting colonial bent grasses. We're struggling right now. Every company is, are we lost our last field two years ago, have not mm -hmm. been able to replace it. We don't even have um, um, bent, um, velvet bent grass is another one we cannot get produced right now. Well, I tell you, Leah, we will save the state of the seed industry for another day. I'll get you on the long podcast. We'll do a long conversation. <laughs> about the status of the seed industry that I think no matter what part of the grass business you're in, as I understand it, Leah, uh, seed supplies are gonna be tricky uh, and prices are going up because of what you said. Uh, there seems to be hard, a more difficult time to get people to grow some of these niche uh, plants. I mean, I mean, you know, maybe even ryegrass that a lot of people grow, I believe you guys are saying, with the winter and the early spring cold, maybe that's impacted the harvest there as well. Well, and the big thing is we had huge demand for grass seed last year. Who knew everybody wanted to plant grass during the middle of a pandemic? And- um, <laughs> Don't figure. <laughs> who knew that? That's right. <laughs> um, it's gonna be a struggle this year to get um, crop in and crop is, it's going to be an, it's going, we tapped a long time yesterday. It's going to be an interesting fall. May you We're live gonna, in interesting times. That's exactly right. And Carl, what could be more interesting than a Thursday morning conversation with Leah Brillman? Let me know, Carl, what is? 
No, nothing is. And that's why it's the fastest 30 minutes in turf, right? It, right? it goes by before you even know it. Again, we're breaking the space time continuum here. <laughs> uh, disobeying the laws of physics. But, uh, you know, thanks. Thanks again, Leah, for, for coming on, talking about seed. Um, uh, you know, again, we, we've highlighted this uh, BMP tips of the day, uh, really using the new varieties you talked so much about today. There's a lot of work that goes in that, and, and it's been a real cost-effective way to, to reduce resource use and, and to improve conditions on golf courses uh, all across the nation. So, uh, you know, with that, we'll, we'll get everybody out of here. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Tomorrow's guest, Chase Straw, we'll have him on to talk about precision sports field management. That'll be an interesting conversation. But uh, until then, we'll see you guys next, uh, next time. This has been a production of Cornell University on the web at cornell.edu.